As, uh, as you find your way back in, I want to do a little, uh, couple of housekeeping things. If you're going on a tour, please make sure that you're congregating back by the main entrance about 1245. For the rest of you that are going to stay in the convention center and participate in the breakout sessions, those breakout sessions begin at 1 p.m. today, okay? Um, in the ballroom will be the leadership policy group, and we're going to be thinking about uh, current and future education policy as it affects Texas and beyond. We have uh, the TLC Cubed implementation team that would be presenting about how they got from where their idea started to here today. And uh, Dr. Billy McConnell, who is uh, from Abilene Christian University and Connected Consulting, is going to be talking about getting buy-in for these types of initiatives. The digital textbooks and apps, we have a great lineup in that. Um, it's in room 103C, which is directly out the doors this way. Um, we have uh, Aline Sada, who comes up uh, from Monterrey, Mexico, and is going to be speaking about um, apps, discovery, curation, and sharing, and a, uh, and a great tool that she's developed to help educators find apps. Dr. Robbie Melton from uh, the Tennessee Board of Regents has curated an amazing amount of apps for educators tagged, ready to use for you today, and she's going to talk about the uh, great repository that the state of Tennessee has put together. Creating e-textbooks, if you've been thinking about how you could create content, Apple will be doing a presentation about the new iBooks Author, which is an amazing tool that allows you to create really compelling, dynamic, engaging, and, and be able to put it on a device like the iPad. And then uh, finally, the TLC Cubed Showcase, to be able to see and talk firsthand with a lot of the teachers, the people who are putting the, uh, the real emphasis in learning. They're going to be uh, talking about the TLC infrastructure. How do you prepare a school for 25,000 iPads? No small task. How do you enhance the differentiated practice? How do you think about bilingual education? How do you think about special education and serving those types of populations with tools like the iPad? And then finally, thinking about how you do authentic student assessments. Those are some of the samplings of the things that are going on, and I hope that you will uh, find some of those all throughout this facility. And uh, then at 4 o'clock, we're going to come back and have a, have a wrap-up as, as we conclude today's session. But before we do that, I need to introduce you to Marco Antonio Tornes. Marco Torres has taught high school for 10 years. He's been a media coach and an educational tech and technology director for San Fernando San Fernando High School in Los Angeles, California. It's one of the largest urban school districts in the nation. Um, in addition to his work in the classroom, Marco is a, a professional filmmaker and a photographer who loves to use digital storytelling and the techniques that he uses as a filmmaker to enhance the curriculum. He's been recognized as a California Teacher of the Year for his use to empower minority students it's an amazing kind of story that uh, Marco brings to us. He sits on the board of directors from the George Lucas Educational Foundation, the New Media Consortium, Full Sail University Online Advanced Studies. He's been recognized for other um, work with some really ultra cool organizations like TED and the Big Idea Fest. Please welcome Marco Antonio Torres. I just to, thank you, George. Thank you for putting some chile on those tacos, man. <laughs> uh, okay, number four. Okay, point over there. Uh, switches to number four. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Oh, oh, there, 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 there. I did it. I did it, Poppy. No worry. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, well, it's still really early for me, so I must still really early for us. But anyhow, I should be getting up by now, so I've already had my cup of coffee. But anyhow, thank you very much for having me here. It actually took me, I guess so. It took me longer to get here than it, it took me longer to get here than, than it takes me to get to Europe uh, yesterday. <laughs> How many of you could relate to you traveling yesterday? <laughs> it took forever to get here. I just never thought I was going to make it. I, okay, I feel like I, I, I aged two years um, just to get here. Um, 
Anyhow, uh, I'm going to just kind of just jump in and just show you some really cool stuff because it always makes me less nervous like when I get a chance. I always do this in the classroom too is kind of jump in and just show something really cool. What I like to do is show people that I love to learn. I always like to do it with kids because I've discovered that especially as a producer, the more you produce shows where you're showing people you're learning, the more the kids are more likely to learn as opposed to producing shows where people are teaching. A good example is I've had the honor and the privilege of working with the Mythbusters. Any fans of the Mythbusters? Oh, there, you've got a couple of claps there. Um, one of the things that makes the show really special is that you're not watching two guys teach, you're watching two guys learn. And so one of the things I always challenge teachers wherever I go, are your kids watching you learn or are they just watching you spew and deliver? I mean, just a reflection. I mean, where is the evidence that you are learning? So I, I like to kind of start off to show you something that I think is really cool. Um, garage band, or as our friends in England call it, garage bond. Okay? Let me see if it works. Oops. Okay. Start over. All right. Uh, this is really cool. Let me see, new song. And I'll um, control the volume from here. In case it's too loud. So, what's really cool about this app is. Um, you know, you've got these instruments here. You've got um, like a keyboard here, and you can play. Okay. How many of you know how to play the piano? How many of you don't know how to play the piano? Okay, good. This is for you. So this is going to work out. Okay. So what's really cool about this is that you can play the piano if you wanted to. And it's like what Bill was mentioning, uh, you know, technology has a way to replicate the real thing. And sometimes it's just not the same. And, you know, this is definitely not the same thing, but technology does allow us to change the interface. So a lot of times even change the rules. And when you play the piano, uh, there's two things that I learned, or, well, you know, when I, was, when I was trying to ask questions about how to play a piano, it says, oh, you just got to stay on tempo and you just have to know what key you're in. Uh, those are two major problems for me, okay? <laughs> uh, but however, we can, so you could just go up to a piano and say, keys that I don't need disappear. Could you do that? Could you say to a guitar, strings that I don't need disappear? You had to actually learn how to adjust around the physical needs and the physical dynamics of the instrument. In other words, you had to learn how to use the device to achieve the goal that you set out to achieve, right? To create music, correct? I mean, creating music is the goal, not to play an instrument. I'm sure you would agree, okay? To actually generate music. So with that challenge, I thought this was pretty cool. So as you can see in GarageBand, you have this new thing here called um, like smart keyboard. So it tells you the keys on top. So this is like the key of, I don't know what key that's in. Any many musicians here? It's in the key of C major. Because you see it out there on the side, it says C major. Let me just go ahead. So any keys that I hit, okay, that's C, that's F, okay. So and I can hit combinations. cool it kind of sounds like I know what I'm doing because what it does <laughs> it's basically said those are the keys you're gonna play let me set them up for you okay so this is kind of cool it also has this little feature called autoplay it's that little knob that you see so if I hit it like to like one if I just hit just one it's gonna play like a, a, a sequence do this cool stuff like that um, but I'm just gonna just because of time I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of put a song here together for you um, so there's a, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and first I'm gonna start with the drums and go to instruments and again I have regular drums so if you actually know how to ooh, that's not regular drums you have one is that where are you here's regular drums so if you know how to like come on. Okay, and then you can just run your fingers through, I guess. Okay, so we can impress people like that. But I don't know if my song is going to sound good if I just did that. Okay, so I'm just going to go to smart drums. And um, this is kind of a nice little XY graph here. So it shows you that on the left it's simple, 
and on the Y, so on the X coordinate, it tells you it's simple to complex. So if I put a drum, if I, and that's kind of a simple kind of drum, and it's, by the way, it's louder and quiet, so if I want to do a little louder the drum, I mean quiet the drum, okay? And then if I want to more complicate it, okay? But I want to keep it kind of simple, okay? And then I have this little shaker thing, okay? And so I like that. So I'm just gonna hit record, and it's just gonna record two bars of that. Okay, and there it is. So I recorded that. So I'm gonna go over here, and I've already, now what I'm gonna do is add a bass, right? Musicians, isn't that the way to do it? Okay, gotta do a little bass. Same thing here, is this a smart bass? Okay, so here I go. And what's cool about this is that if I've got no sense of tempo or rhythm, folks, um, here, there's a, there's a little, here's a cheat. You, um, you come over here, and you see quantization on the right. That, quant, that actually helps align your beat to, a, to, uh, to uh, an actual uh, fraction. So this is a great way for those of you that are teaching math, especially to fourth graders. Um, it's a great way to, to get them to see what fractions looks like in the context. So here's a math way. So the kids can actually see what happens and you hit the different kinds of alignment. And actually, what it does is it puts that song, it fixes my timing. So it corrected my timing. So if I have no sense of rhythm, it doesn't matter. It'll quantize it for me. Okay? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add another instrument. And uh, let me see here, I've got guitars, okay? So again, this is really cool. You have this smart instrument where again, see? Okay, here it goes. And then I can hit the strings inside there. Or I can do a little Spanish style. My mom saw me doing that with my headphones. She goes, ¿Por qué estás haciendo cosquillas at the computer? Why are you tickling your computer? And I'm like, I'm playing the guitar like this. And then I could muffle it on this side. Doesn't that sound like I know what I'm doing? It's great. Just don't tell anybody a secret. We're trying to impress people. All right. So I'm going to just go ahead and hit record here. about this is that if I play something like that and then I can say uh, no way okay and then come over here and I just can't can Okay, so I've got now um, three different instruments there that I've added. This is a new one. So those of you who just got the new um, garage band, it's got smart strings. And so what's really cool on this one is if I just, on the very top, you see all the different instruments that are used. So it's got a first violin, second violin, viola, cellos, and basses. So if I just hit one of these, like C, you see that? And then I can, here's another one where if I just kind of run my finger. Can 
It gets louder when I do it. And then I can, the cool thing about this is I can choose different ones, so romantic. So, so now I can choose these chords, so. Isn't that cool? And what's good about this is that I could actually even eliminate this, all the other ones, so I could just have just like a cello and a bass. And so what's cool is that now I can add that. So let's say I'm digging that. So I'm just going to hit record. And so now I could actually take off the, the metronome because I don't need it anymore. I've got everything. So now if I wanted to play it, I've got a little sound here. Well, did you guys like that? Right. And what I like about this is, um, what I like about this is, oops, is I mean, you could really do some really cool stuff uh, with this. Let me see how this sounds. I just drop a little, a little uh, loop there. that do you think this may turn on some kids to want to come back tomorrow absolutely and there's this other thing that's really cool and I don't have a chance to show you here today but if uh, one thing I just learned is that if you actually get if you have your iPod or another kind of an iPad device that has other instruments to it you can connect a little there's an adapter uh, that allows you to basically connect two iPods again you can have your own little DJ session so you have two turntables, or you can play the guitar here uh, from another instrument, and you can record it straight into GarageBand, and you can do a lot of kind. You can basically bring in uh, sounds from any other devices, and and to me, it's really exciting because uh, you know music is one of those things that, as I traveled across the U.S., we schools that have music programs usually falls into an orchestra or a band or a marching band, and. Also, the other thing that I've noticed, observation, is really these are programs where kids are taught how to follow instructions on how to play music, on how to follow music. But they're not really like, like for example, our school has a really big mariachi program. And I always told my mariachi teacher, why, why don't you do something different? Instead of having the kids sing all these other mariachi songs, why don't you have your kids re like do their own mariachi song? I mean, seeing a 14-year-old sing about like negative codependency relationships and alcoholism is just kind of weird. <laughs> You know, pobre de mi. I'm like, you're 14. <laughs> um, take this opportunity to do new stuff, just like school plays. Encourage to write new school plays. I mean, just a question. I mean, this is an opportunity that we have. So to me, this is an important little kind of a start here for my presentation because, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'll do that thing there, then over there, and then there. It's a combination of how you do this. So, I mean, for me, one of the things that I found real important is, like, what do I love? And I actually really love to learn. I really love to learn. My mother was a pretty famous uh, uh, photographer in Los Altos de Jalisco. Um, and growing up, I mean, I grew up in photo studios. Her brothers were, uh, two of my uncles were responsible for, I guess, according to last year, Tashem did this, put, published this great book together about Mexican films. And my two uncles were responsible for eight of the worst 100 films ever made in Mexican history. <laughs> I grew up on a set watching Mexican wrestlers defeat everybody from aliens, mummies, vampires, and bad politicians. Um, 
The last movie one of my uncles worked on was Lola La Trailera, if any of you know that movie, about the woman who just got caught up in the drug cartel. It was great to be four on the set of that movie, okay? <laughs> but what I loved about it is I loved the process of making. I, even though they were terrible films or whatever, I just liked how everybody worked together to create something. And it was something that was really important to me. So when I became a teacher, um, I really wanted to figure out ways and opportunities on how I can get kids, like what do kids really love? Um, I gotta show you this video though first because just from what I, like, let me show you what happens when people know how to use the iPad and the iPhone, so. I got a feeling that this year is gonna be a good year. You can hear his auto tune. This is gonna be a good year. That this year is gonna be a good, good year. Pretty crazy, isn't it? I wish I had the time to show you. I actually have a compilation of videos of new school orchestras done with iPads. You know, look it up, just go to YouTube, type in like school orchestras, iPad school orchestras, orchestra is amazing. But I have to show you this one here because about a week and a half Apple, after Apple released um, uh, the, uh, the, the second iPad, uh, no, I'm sorry, the, the iPhone 4, we were in Hong Kong, I think, yeah, I was in Hong Kong, and somebody had told me about a group of kids, high school kids, that put together a band and recorded, and I'm going to share with you there. By the way, this was within two weeks from the release of this device. They're clever, they're even telling you what apps they're using. Pretty impressive, right? None of one of, not one of those kids is in, a, is in a music program at school. Okay? Just something to, to look at. But one of the things that I always find interesting is if you love something, you'll figure out a way to do it. And just to kind of go off of what Bill was saying, I mean, the formula that he talked about, about consumption, uh, curation, creation, um, uh, uh, creation and collaboration, I mean, to me, people who are in love know that. For real. They, they, these are people who, who want to share, uh, people who love to do something. When they love to learn, when they have hobbies, they cannot wait to share it with you, share their learning, what they're doing. And if they know that you're a little bit aware of it, they want to show you what they've done wrong so that you can help them. And I love that, that natural formula that I see because that's about learning. Schooling, on the other hand, has a different formula. And it's interesting for me, because one thing that if I came to this conclusion years ago, that a lot of our kids, a lot of us love learning, except schools get in the way. School structures, analog structures, the instrumentation, all of that stuff. I'm just that we're in a time now we can ask some fundamental questions, like the questions Bill was talking about. So just one of the questions that I kind of came across when I came to San Fernando High School, this is a very, um, it's a very tough school. It's about, um, about five, just one school, 5,200 kids. Of uh, the 5,200 kids, we have about 385 teachers at the school. It's the second oldest um, high school in Los Angeles Unified, and it was built 115 years ago to deal with the immigrant question. 
They're still asking the same question. <laughs> Our school is like 99.9% .9 uh, Mexicano, it's not even Central American. I'm convinced that we have a new state from all the kids at our school. It's called Wajalmich <laughs> Sac. Guanajuato, Jalisco, uh, Michoacan, and Zacatecas. So Wajalmich Sac, that's where, where all of our kids are from. Um, like I'm from Jalisco. And so on the other one, you see the map of San Fernando. You see a little dot way up top. It's about 16 miles northeast of Los Angeles, or about three hours on the on the 170? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but we had a lot of, um, a lot of challenges. Like I come from, from a big Mexican family. My, I have 63 first cousins. Uh, my dad's got 16 brothers and sisters. I was convinced growing up, I was, convi I was related to anyone with an S or a Z in the end, the last of their name. <laughs> um, and to me, it was really important for me when I actually went to school, uh, when I went to go teach there, because I had been working in politics for about four years prior to that. And I could not understand how my cousins were entering this school, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and in the span of three years, many of them were, being, um, uh, were making very poor decisions along the way. And a lot of them uh, suffered serious consequences. And I wanted to figure out what, what's going on. The other statistic that blew my, blew my mind is that of the 5,000-some-odd kids, I mean, we have about 640 kids on the average that graduate from San Fernando High School, but we have 1,800 ninth graders. And some other kind of crazy things that started to kind of hit me is that I live in Silmar, which is the biggest youth correction facility in Los Angeles. And when I would go in there, I, this is the truth, I used to go to Silmar Youth Correction Facility with my students after night to help edit because we didn't have any machines at our school. So I had to actually take them to jail so we can use their computer lab. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, so when I actually went to, um, when I would go to these places, all the kids, hey, what's up, Taurus? What's up, Taurus? What's up? And it would break my heart, because I'm like, man, I'd love to walk down UCLA and hear, what's up, Taurus? What's up, Taurus? And you know, I was really frustrated. So from day one, I was tired of, of, of providing a third world, third rate education for kids that deserved a first world, first rate education. Um, I was tired of it. I was tired of excuses. I knew that whatever decisions that we had to make, we had to make decisions that were best for the individual kids. We needed to figure out how to connect what they loved and to figure out the other connections that are necessary. Connections, connections, connections. And our kids do love to learn. And not only that, the stories of our families, because I'm, 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 I'm assuming, based on what I've seen in the last 24 hours, that your community is very similar to mine. Okay? So there are a tremendous amount of learning opportunities that our community offers that we're not taking full advantage of in our schools. So that was a route I took. And so early on, we didn't have technology at our school. I actually had to go to the local middle school to use our technology under the condition that um, I helped their parents and their parents Saturday classes for parents. And um, we did this for a couple of, we did this for a couple of years, every Saturday, volunteer. And I would take students from the high school to go and, and do this. And I'm gonna take you down a little memory lane because I just saw this video, just to show you kind of how things started out. But I want you to see, this was in 2002 or 2003. So the questions that myself and my students were asking back then. I'm only going to show you a little bit. This short documentary by a San Fernando Valley High School student portrays the stark reality of growing up in his neighborhood north of Los Angeles. This one right here, this is my house. About two years ago, there was a drive-by. I was playing out with my little brother, and they were shooting the bullet from this point out to the building over there. You can still see the bullet hole by the window. See if you could get a little bit of the tree. But these days, thanks to a unique video production class, the shooting at San Fernando High School involves video cameras. And when students hang on the street corner after school, they're often outside their teacher's house, tapping into his wireless web connection on their laptop. That's, that's cool. You actually get to see that. The program that has made a dramatic difference in the lives of hundreds of San Fernando High School students is housed in room 307, the computer inspiration studio. So I'm going to save it. Now let's just say I'm going to make some more pages here. I'm going to... Here, students can take fifth and sixth period classes in everything from website design to video editing. They also spend time here after school and on weekends working on digital projects for core classes like social studies and economics. 
We're going to have like extracurricular yeah. going up, and it can be blurred. The program, which now includes some 100 members of the San Fernando Education Technology Team, started in 1999 in a janitorial closet with three students, one laptop, and a social studies teacher named Marco Torres. We have a camera now, and you guys can go out and shoot. If I look back at my own education, I remember the projects I made. I remember the hand I made in kindergarten, you know, the little uh, the plaster. I remember the volcano I made in third grade. I remember the games I won as a baseball player because they were projects. They were things that had an end to them, something tangible, something that I can say to my mom. Mira, mami, lo que hice. Look, mom, look what I did. The main page, like colors. And I know it's important. So when I do projects for kids, I try to give them something that has meaning. It's not just disconnected information. I mean, for me as a teacher, it's my moral obligation to make information real and connected. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not teaching. What's our plan? Torres students have already produced some 200 digital movies which stream over the website the technology team created. Team members also volunteer to teach other students, teachers, and community members in free Saturday morning computer classes. Mi Barrio producer Cesar Larios, who graduated last year, volunteers at the school, passing out to others the knowledge he gained here. We all have to work together in order to get ahead. So when I learn something, you know, it's my duty to go and help somebody else, you know, to learn it. And then that person will pass that knowledge to another person and will continue until everybody knows it. So that, that's, that's really critical, working together. It's a record, right? Yeah, it's like... Ah! like Kind of yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Just, you'll have to sacrifice yourself for the team. All right. No problem. All right. In addition to picking up technical skills, students learn lifelong skills in the collaborative process, oh, yeah. working okay, well, in small works. teams to help complete each other's video. Oh, that was better. I got to see your face there. <laughs> and obviously, in the future, when you get a job, you're going to have to learn to work with people. And this is a place where you can actually get to learn to work with people because you get in groups and you know that you have to push each other to get that done on time. I've been working on it all year long. Just from working on this project, I received a lot of leadership skills, being in charge of all the deadlines, and making sure everybody did their work, like putting them in committees and just telling them what parts to do of the movie. And also, just by working on this program, you learn mathematical skills. Like, you have to know like all the rotation of all the different axes, just in case you want to move the snowman 90 degrees. Since we all took parts in doing little things, I did a sled and carpet and stuff like that. And it actually takes pretty much a lot of time, but since there's a lot of us, it goes pretty quick. Mm -hmm. <gasps> so, <laughs> it's kind of a look back in history there. Uh, but one of the things that it was very important for me, that, by the way, that was all shot on Saturday. I mean, that was a Saturday, with just a couple of corrections. It's called the Community Inspiration Studio, and that was shot on Saturday. And we had a really successful program where we can actually come in and, and, um, in, and really focus with parents on things that are important for them on their daily lives, not necessarily how to create apps, I mean, how to use Microsoft Office, but how can they use it to help improve the quality of life that they have. But again, one of the things that myself as a teacher, I started to see, again, the challenge that I had about learning versus schooling. As, a, as, a, as an emergency credential teacher, I, did, I, knew, I knew that I was very restricted as far as changing schooling, but I know that I can have an impact on learning. And so one of the things that, I, uh, one of the stories I like to tell is, um, and I'm a huge photography fan, all aspects of photography, and um, here is actually the first camera, the first actually uh, photographic apparatus that you could actually purchase. And this is a picture of it from the Scientific American in 1886. And you can see it here. Now, it also came with some instructions. And it actually basically shows you here that there are 27 steps for you to learn how to take a picture. So in order for you to take the picture, folks, you need to be able to do all of this. This is your formula. In order for you to take a picture, you needed to know a lot of stuff. And to me, curriculum is a fancy word for stuff, OK? is knowing stuff. It's what you do with the stuff. It's the process of turning those nouns into verbs that I think is the added value that Bill so eloquently um, shared with us. So if we take a look at that process, taking a picture is hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. It doesn't look very fun, right? Because what happens is this dominates, okay? Not taking a picture. So 
A couple years later, ironically enough, Kodak now just filed chapter 11, but uh, Kodak actually came out with a process and said, hey, I'll tell you what, you push the button and we do the rest. And they even have pictures there. On three steps, that's all you need to do so you don't have to worry about it, so that you can focus on taking pictures, right? So Kodak makes my photo taking experience and you could fill in the rest. So again, as a teacher, was my goal to teach kids how this camera works or was it this? Or could I see it as a yes and? Could I maybe revisit how it's done after I get go this way? So, you know, this is kind of an interesting challenge that I had, which one, to me, one represents schooling and one represents learning. The other formula that I thought was very interesting for myself is uh, I was always told growing up that if I just came to school every day and did whatever my teacher told me, I would be successful. How many of you were told the same thing? Okay? All right, some of you are like, okay, <laughs> my teacher's over there. Uh, <laughs> this is what we were told. And really, realistically, that's not, that's not actually an accurate formula. There's a little more complicated than that. But one thing that just in my observations, I realized that, you know, it's a little bit more uh, involved. To me, love is something that's it's still very important. The more and more people I've had a chance to see that I consider are successful and doing great things are people who are in love. And like, for example, even my chance to work with uh, John or Bill, you can tell, that you, could, you'll, by the, you haven't heard John, but you can tell that he's in love. You can tell Dr. Ponce is in love. You can tell Bill's in love. And that's something that's important. When I walk around, I mean, are you in love with the verbs? Or are you in love with the nouns, you know? Um, uh, do you have curiosity? Are you curious? Okay, is curiosity involved? Um, the other thing that I think is important, access. Do you have access to resources that not only allow you to create, but also allow you to collaborate, to curate, to consume? Um, you also have, and I'll see that, and, and that actually then adds another question, choosing the right media. We now have in our pockets, as Bill was mentioning, the ability to create not only any kind of media, but distribute it from our, from our person. Um, so obviously that distribution is basically enhanced, multiplied by the size of your network. To me, ultimately, that will mean your success. Now, that little tongue-in-cheek success with a dollar sign, that's just kind of tongue-in-cheek there. Someone says, doesn't mean money all the time. Well, just success is there. So I love this ad here, because this ad here kind of, somebody just shared this with me, because I presented this recently, and they said, hey, you got to look at this ad. And this one I've titled Tree. Can you tell me what f-stop you had the aperture set to? Uh, pretty big. And the shutter speed? Really quick. How did you compensate for the diminished light? Very well, thank you. With features like compact long zoom, Leica lenses, and intelligent auto, Lum I love that ad because it actually reminds me a lot of, those, of that iPad, of iPad band. Someone says, well, they're not really a band. Really? Just a question, really? I love this ad here. I was in Australia when these guys made this film, and I don't know if you got a chance to see this. But one of the things that I've been kind of looking at is sharing with teachers, again, what does, so if you love learning, what does that look like? Do only you know what that looks like, or do others know what that looks like? Because in a time now, especially with your iPad and personalizing of learning, if you have a hobby, most likely you have blogs, you follow YouTube, you've got bookmarks to things that you love. Okay? So what I thought was funny, what I, what I, what I thought was interesting is I love this ad here, because this one really shows about how this person loves to learn. And here is just a clip of what that looks like. Push. 
I love that video. But one of the things I always challenge teachers is like, what does, if you were to make a video next week of what learning looks like at your school, what would it look like? Well, challenge your kids, challenge your colleagues to put together something to show what does learning look like. For you, not just your kids. I'm a big advocate that if you're learning and if you love to learn, guess what's going to happen? Okay, that's just what I believe. Okay, that's one thing that's really something that's really important. So again, what does learning look like? So again, for me, I always begin with like what I love. And obviously, I have two little boys that I mean, I just can't stop breathing. I mean, I can't without thinking about my, my two little boys, Sol and Rio. And um, for me, they're obviously super, super important to me. So one of the things that I always ask myself is like, what can I do to ensure, my essential question is, what can I do to ensure their love for learning? What, what are some of the things that I can do? So my challenge, obviously, that I have for myself and have for their, their, their teachers is to ensure their love for learning. And that's my kind of control because I'm tired of providing a third world, third rate education to kids to provide. So this became a speech for me. So whenever teachers came to me with problems, I always tell them, look, you have three options. We only have three options. You can quit, we can complain, or we could innovate. I don't know if there's any other options. Somebody said, or die. <laughs> But those are our three options. We can quit, complain, or innovate. So one of the things that I always wanted to focus on is like, my mom always said in Spanish, quick victories builds will. And so one of the things that I thought was really important is to really learn from who are our parents. I just, you know, at our school, our parents knew, I mean, our teachers knew very little about the people in our community. They knew very little about our area. You know, one of the things that I remember I was telling a bunch of kids is that I discovered like Guadalajara, which is really where the majority of our kids are from, means river of rocks in Arabic. And I remember when I told them that, they were like, what, Arabic? And then we just started to look in the history of that. So we started to do a lot of projects where we talked about immigration. And not immigration like this. Uh, my name is uh, Pepe Montes, and this is my grandfather. Grandfather, what's your name? Oh, Francisco Montes. Uh, are you an immigrant? Yes. When did you come? In the 60s. Was it hard? Yes. And that was my grandfather, okay? <laughs> and I would see these videos, I'm thinking, no, you know what? I want, them, I want the kids to kind of focus on something that would be really cool. So one of the things I always tell the kids, you know how your grandparents always used to tell you a story over and over and over again? And then how many of you, unfortunately, have lost your grandparents, okay? And when they lost, it's just like somebody else would tell the story and that something there was missing, you know, in the story. Especially like, uh, my particular abuelito, depending on the number of women that were around, his numbers would always change, like how many people he used to fight and stuff, just to <laughs> impress them. So what I did is, I would ask the kids to go home, you know, to, and I would give them really, uh, again, I was also a really big fan of this Quick Victories Builds Will. So all of our projects were around five minutes or less. They were not very long, because I really wanted people that, after the kids produced something, that whoever the viewer was watching could become interactive and involved, so that they have more questions. So they feel they can participate. So it's not just a project that was filled with answers, but really kind of what Seth Godin was talking about. It's just kind of presenting uh, the, the problem. So what I'd like to do is, is share with you one of these videos that uh, a ninth grade girl and a 10th grade girl did a couple years back about their grandfather. Adios, mi chaparrita. No llores por tu pancho, porque se va del rancho y pronto volverá. <ríe> Mi nombre es Antonio Cruz Nava, nacido en el rancho Buenavista, México. Allí nací y allí me crié y hasta que me volé y me vine para acá, para Estados Unidos. Me, me fui para San Francisco y allá estuve como, como unos como seis meses. Pues allí sufre uno mucho tocante a la, a la idioma por no saber uno conversar, no sabe uno pedir en comida o en veces en la, iba uno a las tiendas americanas y pues estaban por inglés y el español no, 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 lo, no lo hablaban y pues batallaba uno mucho para comprar algo así.
Y luego entonces llegué a una cafetería y pues no había ni dónde ir a pedir comida. Y entré a esa cafetería y el único que me aprendí más era café y donas. Y llegaba yo allí y la señorita que atendía, pues ella me preguntaba qué que quería. Y pues yo lo que sabía nomás le decía, I, I want a café and donas. Y eso estuve almorzando mucho tiempo, muchos días. Serían por unos uh, 15 o 22 días. Me iba al trabajo, ¿verdad? Y luego entonces, uh, un día llegué en la mañana temprano y entró un señor americano y luego pidió, pidió un este, GMMX. Y la, entonces yo traía un, una libretita y a mi modo a, a, la apunté, ¿no? Apunté GMMX. Y entonces... Uh, eso ya otro día cuando fui, entonces en la mañana, entonces le pregunté a la señorita, le dije, Gemenex, eh, hizo, no more coffee donuts, no, Gemenex. Eh, entonces luego ya, entonces me llevó, me llevó el este Gemenex, el plato con jamón, papitas y un pan, y bueno, y, y entonces llevé mi café y pues di una almorzada ya muy a gusto. Y ya después, en la mañana, cuando me levantaba, iba a, a, a irme al trabajo, iba ya a esa cafetería y entonces ya era lo único que, que pedía ya, nomás, gémenes. What's, to me, what's amazing about this, when we did this, we did end up 160 grand, uh, grandparents in the story. So now we were able to create and capture the stories that cannot live the storyteller. And it gives an important preservation to the culture of my community. I always tell kids, the more, in order for us to be in interdependence, you need to have independence. You need to be very strong on who you are and what you can contribute. And so what I thought this video was, these videos were really good, is that we always have a big event and we show them. I mean, to, and to have kids applauded for something that they do. I mean, one thing that I, was a big moment for me as a teacher, think about what other opportunities do you have to be applauded? What other stages do we build for our kids besides football stadiums and maybe a, a performance stadium? And who gets applauded? What happens to the other kids? We now have an opportunity to build more stages, more opportunities for kids to be applauded for something that, was, that they contribute. And I thought it was really cool because some of our kids, you know, I always remind them that people are applauding you for something that was in your head a few months ago. That's it to me, it's, it, it's super, super important. So here's another example. Here's a, a little example of my traviesos, of my troublemakers. So this kid here, on the, the kid here on the left, he's the only young man that would ever get brought to me by school police because he was caught hopping the fence coming into school. <laughs> um, uh, it, because actually we, we had a track system, so we had kids that were off track. So if you were off track, you could not come back to school unless you were in an AP class. Um, so he really wanted to come in and work on music, and so he, he would basically sneak in school and come into my classroom and work on music. Um, you know, I'd always tell him, you know, uh, Adrian, the only thing is just make sure you do music that's not going to get me fired. And, um, and you know, Adrian would, res would respect that. And so I always like to do projects like, um, so here I got Adrian who liked to rap and Frankie who loved to do beats. He loved putting music together. I mean, that was his calling when, when I showed him that you could make beats. And then I got uh, Raquel who loved visually. She was a great visual artist. So I would always do projects like, okay, you three, you get together and I need you to put together, um, you know, put a song together, make a music video, and then get in the news, okay? Uh, and the kids had to learn how to, you know, put together a press release and what is the angle. And um, so here's one of the, here's a video of these three put together. Let me see if it plays. We all went to a party. I know this is a girl. I'm a man. What? Shut up. This goes on. <laughs> Complicated. But you know what else? I'm infatuated. Age 19, and I'm still at it. Still, this music fanatic. Let me express my thoughts and show my dreams. Whether you take it nice of me, I feed music for the dream of the youth. In their eyes, I see the truth. Them being involved, I see success. Cause now at the moment, I see a mess. 
let me just say, Governor Schwarzenegger, we didn't cross the borders, the borders crossed us, do what you do best, send us back, but I promise we'll be back, back, it's hard growing up when you see those who greet, how those who lead, for many we don't have love to be a Hollywood star, nope, making millions taking us far, hope is all we can do, hard work is all that seems to come through, for those who call us a wet back, can you see me do what I love to do? My dreams, my dreams, can you see me do it? What I love to do, can you see me do it? My dreams, can you see me do it? What I love to do, can you see me do it? My dreams, my dreams, can you see me do it? What I love to do, can you see me do it? My dreams, can you see me going? Can you see me doing what I love to do? Let me explain to you some other things I've been through. What's expected of me? I don't know, let me guess what's expected of you. Who would have known I would be right here getting close and I fear will I graduate my main go? Will I focus or will I let it go? Go, go. You could take away my dreams, what makes me happy? I'm gonna pause there for a second. So if you think of the things that he was saying about, you know, this is what I love to do. So number one, just the word itself is in that song. And if you actually got a chance to listen to some of the things that he said, where else in school would a kid have the opportunity to say those things? I started to really think about, like he had a lot to share. You know, what happens when all my leaders are disappearing? I'd rather continue, you know, uh, I'm, I'm tired of living on my knees. I mean, I think about like, Somebody said, oh, well, in, uh, in a creative writing class. But normally in the U.S., creative writing class comes after the other writing classes. So guess who gets a chance to go to those classes? And to me, it's fascinating because he really wanted to write and tell a story. It's just this was the right stage for him to do it. And as Bill was mentioning, we also had the resources necessary for him to choose the necessary media that he knew would add value to his particular story. And to me, that's fascinating because think about what Decisions that you guys are making for your kids are all based on what's best for that individual kid to kind of help them on that journey. Well, just to let you know, from this, they got a chance to go on the John Lennon bus because Univision did this project on kid thing programs in Los Angeles that are being created to help kids prevent from dropping out of school. And because of that news footage, they got a chance to go on the John Lennon bus to record, which is a great uh, program where uh, this bus travels around the U.S. Um, exposing kids to writing music. Well, the kids then were introduced to, um, uh, uh, to this guy who's the lead singer of this band on the bus who fell in love with, this, with the kids and their ability to make music. And, when they, and I got a call and they asked me, Marco, could we come and perform at your school as a surprise? And we'd like to basically have Frankie and Adrian come up on stage with us for the last song. And obviously I was uh, flattered, I was like, super excited. And they came and that's our school in the background. And they came up on stage to perform the last song with the Black Eyed Peas. Now, let me tell you, just from teacher to teacher, I wasn't there the next day at school, and I hate myself for that. But I would have loved to follow those kids the next day in school. Could you imagine all the high fives and all the winks from the pretty girls? <laughs> I don't think there's a football star in Texas that would have gotten more attention than these two kids did when they got a chance to not only go bring the Black Eyed Peas to the school, but perform with the Black Eyed Peas. Again, I focused on the learning part, and they found an opportunity to feel and be successful. Do you think they wanted to come to school tomorrow? Absolutely. And I'm going to kind of finish off with this one here, because I knew it would be real, something that would be popular. Um, so David Payne, you heard the guitar player in the background. The, one of the things I told the kids, they had to produce their own music all the time for copyright reasons. So one of the things that we did is we basically went and did an inventory at our school on who plays instruments. And, um, and David was a kid who was playing guitar. And he was excited because he had never been asked to record anything. He didn't know that you can actually use computers to record music. He thought you did it just to run Microsoft Office. He didn't think that you could like, record music. So the next day he came back with his trumpets. And then the next day he came back with his uh, guitarron. And the next day he came back with his violin. So I'm like, David, how many instruments do you play? He says, five. I also sing. I'm like, homie, you're your own mariachi band. <laughs> and so we have a film festival every year. And in this particular year, the theme was around Star Wars. And so the kids then, a lot of their projects were kind of around the eye candy. See, I'm always Yoda or, or Mexican wrestlers. Oh, by the way, all of our servers at the school are named after a Mexican wrestler. 
And so anyhow, I told David, David, why don't you recompose all the Star Wars, why don't you recompose a Star Wars song in mariachi style? And I showed him how to use GarageBand and Logic. Well, I showed him a little bit, then he did the rest, and he came back with this. Just one kid, and he didn't stop there. He loved, he had never seen Star Wars. And then he did this one. Cantinero, sirva Montequila, Mariachi, toquenle la que le gusta a mi vieja. Esa me era, esa me era. And here's one, all you Darth Vader fans, can't forget you. like 27 different layers of and so here's a picture of David what I loved watching this young man is once we gave him an opportunity to create an opportunity to curate an opportunity to that is the biggest five minute sign I ever see uh, give him the sign to collaborate um, I mean, to create, to collaborate. I mean, think about that formula. It was easy when he loved it because learning those songs were hard. David had never seen Star Wars. I asked him from a Thursday. By Saturday, I had all those songs. That's what love does. Okay? That's what love does. You figure out a way. And to me, though, it's fascinating to him. It's just watching this young little boy from Arandas, from Arandas um, Jalisco who his dad pulled him out of class, out of school in Mexico at the age of 11 to play in cantinas mariachi music. He was re-brought back to school at 16 in my school of 5,000 kids. You tell me, was that a recipe for success? No, but he carries a guitar. To me, that is telling me something. First thing I asked him is, are you in a music program at my school? And he said, no, I just like to play guitar. Okay? And so to me, that's something that we used to latch on to. And to me, what's fascinating is because now, to this day, and John knows this real well, David, so of all people, I got this uh, letter sent to me at school months after he did this, and it was uh, this huge box and a letter from John Williams who said that of all the versions of the song he's heard, this was his favorite. John Williams, the composer of Star Wars, and as a gift gave him the hand notes to Star Wars. It didn't end there. David now scores the Clone Wars. He works for George Lucas and got a full ride scholarship to LA Recording School. And so. <laughs> so to me, um, it's important because you have a lot of these kids and now you have a, 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 an op I don't call it a, a device. I see it as an opportunity for you guys to figure out where this exists, because this exists in all of you. Now, how do we make sure that it comes out, that collaboration, that sharing part? You know, one thing for me that I could not be here in front of you if it wasn't for my, my network, people like you that I can share this stuff to, that can connect those dots. So, you know, one thing I always tell folks, I, everywhere I go, they say, oh, you know, Mr. Torres, but you don't understand that. My school, teachers just don't get it. Well, one thing I learned early on is that the colleagues that I needed weren't necessarily people at my school. We're living in a time and a place where our colleagues can be anyone. I could not be here if it wasn't for John's help or Bill's help over the years. Or the, some of the Apple guys here, like, Matt and Rodney and Chris McDade. I mean, these people helped me during some difficult times. That's one thing that I always tell. Find your Yodas wherever you go and treat them. Say hi to them just on Facebook or whatever. Say hi to them. Bring them into the equation on what you're creating and what you're sharing. You know, I was asked one time what was, uh, so what is the recipe for success? I always tell teachers that if we can actually get kids to, get teachers. Now, I'm not saying, I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to change the word teachers and kids. If we can get learners to love learning. And the other part is be resourceful. I use the little red paper clip because if you ever know the story of the red paper clip, the Canadian blogger who traded a red paper clip for what? A house. 
And to me, I've, that story was fascinating by Kyle McDonald. And to me, it was, he was very resourceful. But what if you're not very resourceful? Well, you know what? Find resourceful people. So if we can teach kids, if we can teach learners how to love learning, how to be as resourceful as possible, and, or, and, and, yes, and, find other resourceful people, I think that this is a good formula for us. And to me, just to kind of end it up, and end this with you, because this is very important to me, again, why I do what I do, because in your classes, some parent has put your kid, their kid in your hands, and in Spanish has said to you, ahí te lo encargo. I see some nodding heads. That is huge, isn't it? I am entrusting everything to you. My everything to you. And that to me is a beautiful honor because I do everything possible to, and I promise teachers whenever I get a chance to, if I had a chance to work with your children, that I would do everything possible to make learning as relevant, meaningful, as, and, and applicable as possible. That I promise to provide you a first-rate, first-world education. I promise to make sure that I can instill as much curiosity as I can, provide students with that personal access to some sort of a media that's going to allow that individual to share their love with others. So I'd like to share with you something that I <laughs> means a lot to me. And with this, I end. There are two main reasons why I need to get better better at what I do. There are two main reasons why that I must be a better person, a better role model, and a better teacher. On May 23rd, 2004, the sun rose and shined on our home, and it warmth embraced my body, my heart, and my soul. Just thinking of him now warms me up. Let me move on. 27 months later, Sol, and now a river. A river to reflect himself onto. A river to heat up, to light up, and to make sparkle. Now that I have my son in my river, to look at, to feel, to smell, to hear, to love, and to experience. I have two reasons good reasons, two important reasons, to be better, way better. Bill made a uh, good case why cloning is a bad thing. I think Marco made a better case of why cloning would be a great thing. 